Okay, uh, let's uh, go ahead and commence. Let's we open with a word of prayer. Lord, your word is marvelous, and we're grateful that it's to each one of us. We ask, Lord, that as we delve into your mail, that you would speak to each of us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, now, last time I got up here and spoke, I uh, got so encouraged that I was able to cover an, an entire book <laughs> and still got us out of here on time, as I recall. And uh, so since I was able to do that, I thought I'd give it another try, and today we will do the book of 3 John. 2 and 3 John are two of the shortest books in the Bible. In fact, 3 John is just a little bit shorter than 2 John, even though it's got an extra verse in it. And uh, these are personal letters. These are personal letters written by the Apostle John uh, to various uh, churches or individuals. And uh, in this, I want to remind you at this point in John's life, he is a very old man. John lived to about 80, 100 to 101. He was born in in, uh, 6, 86. And uh, so he was about 93, 94 years old when he died. So he lived to a ripe old age and, of course, was the only one of the 12 apostles who was not martyred. Uh, for his his faith. And at some point in his ministry, he had migrated to Ephesus. I'm not sure at what point, because he was also um, one of the leaders in the church at Jerusalem. We uh, recognize that from some of our readings in the book of Acts, uh, where he is mentioned there. But at some point, he moved to Ephesus, and there was quite a great work that took place in Ephesus. Ephesus, uh, if you don't have a map in your head, Ephesus is on the coast of what is now modern-day Turkey. It's on the uh, uh, west coast of uh, modern-day Turkey. And if you might have some kind of an idea about Europe, you know how Italy kind of extends down in and forms a boot down into the Mediterranean Sea? Well, then also Greece comes down into the Mediterranean Sea. And so the sea that's between Greece and Italy is called the Ionian Sea. And the sea between Greece and Turkey is called the Aegean Sea. And so about midway down the coastline, there is Ephesus. The uh, uh, the Caister River comes flowing into the Aegean Sea there. That's the Caister River, not the Keister River. Well, now you'll be able to remember the Caister River for the rest of your life. Okay, the Caister uh, runs down in there, and Ephesus is right there on this big natural harbor that grows there. Now, we in Redmond don't have a real great sense of history. I think back, we go back, this town in Redmond was established in 1910. My parents were about... They were, the the town was about five years old when my parents were born, and they were not born here. But, uh, so we don't have a big, long, stretching history. I feel like I almost have a a kind of an attachment to the beginning of Redmond, because my life has spanned, you know, 70 years of of that time here, and, uh, but it's not very much. Ephesus, on the other hand, had a very long history up to the point of where John finds himself in Ephesus because Ephesus had been established almost 800 years before that time. And over the years, it had grown and it had waned and then grown some more. And of course, you'll remember from our study in uh, Daniel how Cyrus the Great came in, the Persian, and he was conquering everything. Well, one of the places that he conquered was Ephesus. He ended up taking over that, and then later on, someone else takes it over, and and, uh, it's been kind of the story. But at the time of John, Ephesus was very influential and was one of the bigger, more cosmopolitan cities of all civilization. In fact, Rome and Ephesus would have been on an equal footing for the culture and for commerce and all of that. And in fact, the, one of the big draws at Ephesus was the temple 
to Diana or Artemis. And it was considered at the time one of the seven wonders of the world. Now, over the years, that temple had been destroyed, had been burnt down a couple of times, and each time they rebuilt it, it was built larger than ever. And now at the time of John and of Paul, at that point, it was one of the biggest draws. People came from all over the civilized world at that time in order to worship in the temple of Diana, and it was a place to go, and it was, it was a real destination to go to. The temple was not only for the worship of Diana, but it also served as a museum, and it had lots of the art of the time in, uh, encased in it there. And it also served, if you'll get this, as kind of a bank. People would bring their stuff there to keep it safe, and it served as like the Bank of England or something like that. Well, it's at its height at the, about the time of Christ. And then something very interesting happened, and you read that in the book of Acts about how Paul made forays into the city of Ephesus. One time he spent two years there preaching all the time, daily. And what happened was is that slowly, and you recall from one of the stories in Acts, how remember how the, uh, the uh, idol makers the guy, one of the guys who was the, the head idol maker, and he fomented a revolution, you know, a, a revolt against Paul and formed a mob because it was a threat to his very, uh, uh, his way of making a living. And so that's the effect that the apostle Paul was having on Ephesus. And the church began to grow and to grow and to grow. And Ultimately, what happened was the Christian church overcame the temple of Diana. And the temple itself fell into disrepair. People stopped going there. It was no longer the draw that it used to be. And to the point that as everything waned, there are a lot of other things that happened, but all these civilizations that were coming in, the Roman Empire and the various other things that were happening, and the town begins to fall into disrepair, and pretty soon people are moving away. The caster had washed so much silt into the harbor that it was no longer the deep harbor that it used to be. It was no longer the source of commerce between the uh, west and the east. Ephesus started out as an oriental town. It ended up converting into a Greek town, and then finally it just wanes, and it went away, and pretty soon... There was no sign whatsoever that there had ever been a temple to Diana. Completely gone. It wasn't until the 1800s, the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s, that a gentleman went in there and did an archaeological dig and finally found the foundations of the temple. And so they've done extensive digging right there. This is the town that John found himself in. This is the town where John probably died of old age. This is the town that was his base of operation as he served as a bishop, as it were, or an elder uh, to the various little churches that are in the area because, you know, Smyrna and, and Troas and, and some of these other towns were within a day's journey of, of Ephesus. So they're 20, 30, 40 miles away maybe. And so he spent the last years of his life traveling to these different churches they're in the area. And that's who he writes a letter to in the third, his third letter. And we begin in the first verse. The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou dost, doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, 
taking nothing of the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive, receive such that we might be fellow helpers in the truth. That's the first third of this letter. This letter is a very short letter, and it's probably indicative of what a normal letter to friends would be, because it's something that would fit on the size of the papyrus that they would write it upon. So it didn't have to be multiple papers. It would just kind of fit on one. So this is, in effect, the Twitter of that day. Very short, to the point. You know, keep it to a minimum of words. And so it's divided into three parts. The first part is a commendation for hospitality. The second part is a condemnation for a lack of hospitality. And the final two verses is just the conclusion of the letter. So in this commendation, we see that John is identifying himself as the elder. In all of his writings, John tended to leave his name out of it. Uh, I think it was a certain natural humility that he had, recognizing that his was a life that was truly blessed, that he was at the right time, at the right place, that the Lord Jesus Christ would choose him to be one of the 12 disciples. And he did recognize that he had a special connection to the Lord. In several places, he refers to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, so he at least had that grasp of things. John was, in fact, probably uh, the Lord's half-cousin. The Lord's uh, mother, Mary, was the sister of Salome, which is John and James's mother. So they actually had a relation there. John was indeed a disciple early on. It was he and his brother James who made that 70-mile trip to go down and hear what John the Baptist had to say. They were interested in the Word of God. They were interested in what was going on. And so they made that trip down there. So they were there that very day when John says, and he reaches his hand out, and he points to the Lord Jesus Christ who is approaching there. And he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And from that point, John and James and Peter and Andrew all turned and followed Jesus, recognizing early on that he is, in fact, the Messiah. Not fully understanding all that that meant. It took them three, three and a half years, a death and a resurrection, for them to really understand what that meant. But they did know where truth is, and that's what they followed and this is a hallmark of John's writing, is this whole idea of adhering to truth. And so he does right here, as he commends Gaius in his hospitality. And I like how he says this. In other places, they refer to someone as beloved, but he calls Gaius well-beloved, well-beloved. He has already established, I'm sure that in his traveling to the various churches, and I don't know which church he's addressing this to, but uh, he has met Gaius. And I don't know about you, but there are people that sometimes you can meet them, and right off the bat, you're friends. You ever had that experience? It just was just quick. Just spend a, a, a short time with them, and you immediately feel a kinship to them. And I think this is probably what the Apostle John felt towards Gaius. Well-beloved, well-beloved. And he says, uh, whom I love in the truth, in the truth. So he very, very truly, truly, he loves him. He says, beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. He's not wishing that uh, he would, uh, uh, that his health and his body would prosper over and above the prospering of his soul, but yet that his health and body would prosper as his soul prospereth. That is the thing that we all need to seek after and to try to build in our own lives, is that we are nourishing 
our soul, that we are nourishing that part of us that is most important. The Apostle Paul uh, stated it right when he referred to us as spirit, soul, and body. Because we tend to, in our natural man, to think of ourselves as body, soul, and spirit. And we become very concerned about what our body is, how our body looks, how our body is groomed, how our body is decorated, you know, how our body is, you know, skinny, you know. That becomes our greatest concern. And consequently, we have a culture that is always clinging to, uh, to youth. You know, us baby boomers have been clinging to youth all of our lives, you know. And all of a sudden, we wake up and we're old and gray and wrinkled and sagging and, <laughs> and all that. And then we decide, well, maybe, maybe it's a fruitless endeavor. <laughs> now, it's not that we shouldn't decorate ourselves and we shouldn't take showers and all. This is a, this is a good thing. But the reality is we are created before God spiritual beings. We are created in his image, and he is spiritual. And that's what we should understand, because it is our spiritual being that exists and goes forever. And so if we nourish that, all else will follow. Some of the the most attractive people in this world are physically ugly, (laughs) but they're so beautiful spiritually that we're attracted. And that says a lot, says an awful lot. So he says, I pray that you would prosper and your health would prosper just as your soul is prospering because that is the thing that he recognizes in Gaius. And that is the thing that forges the strongest of friendships is when we have a friendship that is based upon a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. When we establish those, those are the most satisfying and enduring of friendships. Those are the friendships that encourage us, and even in the hardest of times, we feel the best about. And that's the kind of friendship that he had with Gaius. That thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospered. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. Now what is going on here is we have these itinerant preachers, evangelists, who are going from church to church to encourage. Um, I don't see that as much in America anymore. We have some uh, you know, big things. I suppose really the rat last real uh, effective evangelist would be someone like uh, Billy Graham, uh, Luis Palau. These are men who really have this gift to to evangelize, to go around, and they and they put on uh, 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 big meetings. You know, and have a, a, a big meeting and draw a whole community to. And this serves a very very useful purpose, and, and it's a good thing. This is a very good thing. But in earlier days, and I can remember even in my youth, that there were itinerant evangelists. That uh, I grew up in the traditions of the Christian church right over here on the other corner. And so from time to time, we would have an evangelist that would come through the area and maybe put on a, a week of meetings, and we all go to church and listen to this man speak a bunch of times. And it was always encouraging, and it was always uplifting, and it was always uh, challenging for us and reviving in a great way. So this is an old tradition, and even at the very earliest times of the church, this is what was going on. In a sense, Paul was that kind of a person. He was going around and establishing churches in all these various areas and planting them, and then would leave men behind to carry on the work as he went and started another church, and another one, and another one. So this is a, a good tradition. Well, this is what was going on even in that area and time, and so apparently this, this man or men or whatever it was, 
has made the rounds, and has come from the church where Gaius is, and brings word to John of what's going on. Now, yesterday when I was talking to Anthony, he said, what's going on? I said, well, I'm studying. And I told him I was going to be preaching on uh, uh, Third John. And immediately he says, oh, what a great one. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Verse 4. How wonderful it is. And so that word comes in. I have no, uh, that I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. There is no better thing than to get distant news, and it comes in and it's good. What a pleasant thing that is. I think of over all the years that I've been involved in the church and the thousands of people that I have met and hundreds who have become friends. And then they go a long distance away and we may never hear, some I've not heard of ever again, but some years have passed and then suddenly we hear of them and the news is good. They're strong in the Lord. Back in the old days, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this uh, uh, a little later as we get into this. Uh, back in the old days, 50 years ago, when we were first married, and um, I, was, I was getting drafted, so I quickly joined the Navy because I didn't want to dig foxholes. It just seemed, I, I hated hard labor. And uh, so I joined the Navy, and it took us to San Diego. And then our good friends, Ken and Vicki, who are sitting here in the room, uh, we uh, uh, started a grand experiment. We first rented a house together for uh, over a year, and then we decided that was poor stewardship, and so we bought a house together, and we shared that house for another six or seven years. And so we had a long history running this commune. Nah, it wasn't a commune. <laughs> but during the course of that time, uh, the Lord led us to, to do this, and we felt vindicated in, in our doing it. We felt that God had, in no uncertain terms, answered our prayers because we sought him first before we did this. And in the course of that, we ended up having a church established in our house. And it was just a little church, and there were some people there. But I, it strikes me that some of the people who came to that little church probably would not have come to a bigger church. There are some people that get lost in a mega church, and even in a church of our size, it can be hard to really establish friendships uh, throughout. I have to say that generally I like a smaller church than the huge, anonymous, bigger church. And uh, so during that time, we had several couples who came to us, and things happened, there were interactions that we had with those people, and their lives were cemented in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think back of some of those relationships that were, seemed kind of fragile back then, and now 50 years later, they're celebrating their 50th anniversary together, and their children are walking with the Lord. And I think, what a wonderful thing that God can do over a long period of time. So this is what we're seeing here, that this word is coming back to John, and John says, ah, this is a refreshment to my spirit. He says, I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I haven't seen you for a while, Gaius, but man, it was good news for me to hear that you are indeed walking in the truth. And then that fourth verse, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And you know what? That is the biggest thing for any parent. Any Christian parent out there, the biggest thing is to have their children walking in the truth. We long for that. And you know what? Kids lead the house. I'm not seeing a lot of young people here, a couple young faces here. When you leave, you're not really leaving. Because our hearts go with you. And when you go out that door, our hearts go with you for years. 
There was a time in our youth when we thought, ah, we'll only have to do this for 18 years. <laughs> no, no, finally it dawns on you, and it's, it's good that it dawns on you not at first, but later on, because you might get discouraged if you realize that at first. But you get towards the end, and then you realize, no, they're your kids forever. You have the concerns for them. You have the love for them. You have the service to them. You, you still continue to do stuff. I told my son, what did you do to get such great parents? <laughs> you know, I said... Here you have, you have two sets of parents here in town, and at the drop of the hat, on the spur of the moment, you can call either set of parents, and they'll take your kids, and they'll take your kids all night long. You can go away and have a weekend. Or if you have a need at the house, you have two sets of parents who will drop what they're doing, come over, and help you do it, and everything else. I said, I want you to think back, son, to all the times that your grandparents came and did projects around the house, or babysat for you. And he went, hmm, zero? <laughs> I said, yeah, what did you do to get such great grandparents, great parents? So the fact of the matter is, is that they never get away from us. Our heart is always with them. And so we need to keep that in mind. Young people, as you're living your life, Keep that in mind, that the life you live is not lived to yourself. And if you don't realize that the life that you live is lived before the Lord Jesus Christ, you must surely recognize that the life that you live is lived with the heart of your parents. I always carried this as a big responsibility when I was growing up. I mean, I, I remember thinking about this. And I can tell you that there's probably a lot of trouble that I didn't get into in high school. There was plenty of trouble that I did get into, but nothing serious. I didn't get into a lot of trouble because I would never want to bring shame upon my family. I thought, I can't do that, you know? It would ruin my parents' reputation. And they would kill me, <laughs> you know? So that's kind of how it went. And so you have to realize, young people, that what the things that you do, first of all, recognize that your parents, would you do that if your mom and dad were looking over your shoulder? Mm, maybe not. And then that should catapult us into the next ca uh, category, because now I no longer have parents who can be shamed and, and, uh, and all, and they don't look over my shoulder and, and all. But I have to recognize that it's God who watches all of my goings. And so we want to live our life a certain way, knowing that we're observable. But we have this connection. And then beyond that filial connection that we have, if we're a child or a parent, we also have a connection one with another. So that in this room, each one of us has a special love connection that binds us and should constrain us. See, you may think that, oh yeah, I'm coming here and I'm just going to church and, and all. But you know what? There's some of you, and I may not even talk to you in the course of any given Sunday, but I can sit over here with my wife and look across the room and I say, oh yeah, there and there and there. People that I see and I love. And I'm encouraged that we're all here together. And in that sense, we have this responsibility to one another, as well as our responsibility to the community at large. So it's a good thing that we bring this joy and finally, this is the joy that we bring also to those who pastor over us. I want to live my life so that my pastor doesn't have to be weighed down by the burdens that I'm bringing to him. And the way we do that is we live in relationship 
to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we seek to build our lives on that way. And we seek to excel in our walk. And we seek to find those ways of service and ministry so that our pastor is not weighed down by that. I think Anthony would agree with me that, because I've heard him say it time and again, that this is a great fellowship. Because there's not a lot of undercurrent things that are going on. There's not any of that infighting that's going on, and we're going to talk about that in the second part of this letter. And so we serve then as an encouragement to him. And it makes his ministry easier because he can concentrate on just expounding the word whether, rather than having to go and put out fires here and there and trying to soothe this and help that. So no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully. I was going to say um, uh, earlier on, it says uh, up in the second verse, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in in health, for I rejoice greatly uh, when you came. Uh, One of the words that's used there is uh, in the Greek is uh, uh, peri, it means concerning. Uh, When he says, above all things, I wish above all things. And uh, it it could be rendered better, and I think maybe in the New King James it might uh, be rendered as concerning the things uh, that I wish concerning the things that thou mayest prosper. And uh, that word concerning is rendered here as above all things, but it could rightfully be rendered the way it is because uh, that word peri does indicate a superiority that it's in its importance. And I wanted to compare that to 1 Peter 4, 8, where uh, he talks there and See if it's going to appear up here, yeah. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. So that in that order of importance, above all things, this is something that we would want to be, fervent in our love for one another. And so in this case, where he's wishing for this prosperity of his soul, it's above all things concerning that. So now I want to delve on into the fifth, uh, fifth verse. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers. Now remember, Gaius has done this to these people who are itinerant pastors and come through there, and they have now bringing the word to John. And he said, uses two words there. They're rendered here in the King James. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren. But it's two different words. One poeo means uh, to just simply to do or to make, uh, to perform. So, So that's what he's doing. He's performing this. He's doing this. And he's doing it faithfully whatsoever thou doest. And that word is ergazomahi, and uh, ergazomahi uh, means to toil, to put effort into it. So whereas one is just the doing of it, the other one is the doing of it, really putting some effort into it. And I think that should be an encouragement to us also, because a lot of times our Christianity can be quite passive, You know, maybe it's just sitting around and grooving to some Christian tunes, you know, or reading poetry or whatever, just kind of sitting back and taking it in. But our walk has to actually involve some effort that is expended toward others. Now remember, the expending of effort in the kingdom of God is never to attain any relationship with God. 
because that has already been accomplished through the finished work of Jesus Christ, and there's nothing more we can add to it. So there's nothing you can go out there and do in order to make yourself right with God. If you're going to go out there and do something, do it with the right motive, which is just simply to walk in the good work that Jesus has created beforehand that you should walk in it. See? But it takes some effort. And a lot of times, especially in our present day and age, we tend to be so busy. And we've got this going on and that going on. You know, it was thought once upon a time that eventually we would have so many labor-saving devices that there would actually be nothing to do. And I find myself surrounded with labor-saving devices, and I've got more stuff to do than I ever had. And so it's so easy then to get sidetracked by the things that we have to do that we forget about the things that we have to do. And so we should be putting some effort into the ministry, the laboring that we can do for one another. There's lots of opportunities around here available. You know, within even just the body of Christ, there's tons of opportunities. We, have, we always have needs in, you know, in the nursery and, the, and in children's church. There's all, and I've never been in a church where there wasn't a need in nursery and children's church. We served for five years. Uh, Gwen and I were the leaders of the children's ministry at a church in the Seattle area. We had 1,000 members. And, you know, one year we did a vacation Bible school, had 300 kids come to vacation Bible school. So we had a lot of people to draw on. And you know something? There was always a shortage of people to draw from. So keep that in mind. Uh, I was talking to Ann this morning, and she says that um, Love, Inc., and we've talked about Love, Inc. before. Love, Inc. is an organization that's trying to uh, 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 mobilize the churches here to be doing the work to have an effect in individual lives. And so we, whenever people come to the church in need, we vet them through Love, Inc. And then we can tell whether it is really and truly a need or if it's a scam, because there's a lot of scamming that's going on out there right now. And we want to be faithful with our resources. And so right now, Love, Inc. is trying to establish um, a ministry to young married couples who are struggling and trying to make ends meet and to meet those needs that they have. And we need people who can go and take the things to these young couples and then be able to take the word to them and, uh, and help them out in their lives. So they're looking for people who can do that. You know, there might be some in here who would have that ability to serve as a mentor to those who really need mentoring. Because being a parent doesn't just, you know, come to you naturally. It takes a little bit of training, some experience. And it takes drawing on the experience of others. Ann also works with the Pregnancy Resource Center. There's an opportunity to help these young women who find themselves in a, in a family way and, and to try to get them to preserve the life of that child who is there from the moment of conception, by the way. It is a child, holy, and completely separate and different in DNA from the, mother of the, the body of the mother. And we should keep that in mind. We should be joining in for Right to Life. In fact, Right to Life is going to be participating in all the county fairs. And so here in the Deschutes County Fair, the end of uh, July and in the first part of August, they're going to need help in manning the booths there because that's a place where we have the greatest interface with just the public at large. And we're finally finding that people's minds are being changed over the years, because for a long time, there's a lot of people saying, oh, well, it's just a mass of flesh, it's nothing, really, you know, it's just a blob, it's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. And when you can show them the little feet of a four-week fetus, all of a sudden, it takes on a whole new meaning. People realize that's a life and lives could be saved. And we're finding now that the attitude is changing because of the introduction of the ultrasound. Now women are able to see that life while it's still in the womb. And they make that decision that perhaps they will not murder that child. See, So there's an opportunity for us to put some effort in and to do stuff. We have a ministry that goes once a, a, a week or once a month to uh, Deer Ridge. 
and we do a Bible study and worship service there. And our ministry is unique to all the other ministries that are there because we're not interested in proselytizing those men. We're interested in evangelizing those men. We're not interested in trying to draw them off onto a role someplace. We're interested in them inculcating the word of God into their lives. And so a lot of those men have never experienced a continual study of the word of God verse by verse going through the book of Romans. And it's having an effect where a number of months ago we had 16 men who came forth to be baptized. We have men who week after week say, we really look forward to you guys coming once a month. Well, it would be very, very nice if we could expand that so we were doing it twice a month so that we would have more continuity because it's hard to, to have continuity as you're teaching verse by verse when it's separated by 30 days. So it'd be nice to be able to go twice a month. But to do that, we need to have more guys who are just willing to go and be volunteers. We need somebody who can hold the radio so that whoever's teaching doesn't have to hold the radio and have it going off in his ear all the time and, and as a distraction, see? So you need people to do that. You need people to go and to greet these men as they come and as they go. Because that's a point of contact with the outside world and to strengthen them so that when they get out, they have an opportunity, have the chance to remain strong with the Lord and to stay out of the prison from then on, not to fall back into the same ways that got them into that place in the first place. So here's just a number of things that can be done for us to put into action our Christianity and to put that labor, that toil into it, that purposefulness, that work as you were, as it were. We can do this. There's a lot of opportunities to do it. Six says, he says, uh, Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. So you have these people, both the brethren, brothers and strangers. You know something? It's a good thing when you take a stranger into your house, especially an itinerant uh, preacher or a missionary or something like that, and they come into the house. It's a good experience, and it's good for them the, the, because you're really showing God's love to them, but you're going to find that it is a great thing for you if you'll do this. Now, I think back to the times when we shared the house in San Diego, we ended up, we bought this place, and we needed a house that could accommodate the church, could uh, accommodate us so that we had our own privacy, and uh, it was really open for hospitality. I'm glad that we learned that lesson of hospitality early on. Gwen and I learned it early before we were even married because I was the youth pastor at the Christian church, and I would go there every weekend. And every weekend, I stayed with the fountains, and Gwen would stay with the pies. So we had one place that we stayed. But every single weekend, they had us scheduled so that uh, uh, Saturday at lunch, Saturday at dinner, and Sunday at lunch, we were in a different home. And we were scheduled around, and we went from home to home to home. And you know what? That's the reason we got to know so many people. And that's why 50 years later, there are still people in the church there in Tillamook that we communicate with and we visit with and we're glad to see and we know who they are. It's because we spent time in their houses over that time. And so it encouraged us and allowed us to establish hospitality in our house. And you know what? We're the ones who benefited from it, not you guys. You know, we're the happy recipients. It was a good thing. So while we had that house in San Diego, we had a missionary to, who had an um, orphanage down in Tecate, and uh, they felt free. They had a key to our house so that when they came, uh, Les and Lois could come in, take showers at our place, do their laundry. Uh, sometimes they'd have to receive mail. We could forward stuff for them and whatnot. They just came and went and became really good friends. And we were blessed by that. And there were other people who were allowed to come in. And even now to this day, uh, we have friends, missionaries in Japan. And... Uh, they are missionaries. She was in my sixth grader class in, in uh, 
when I taught the sixth grade class 30 years ago in uh, the church in, in Bend, in the Evangelical Free Church in Bend. And uh, she grew up and they became missionaries. Well, they have a home base in Chico, California. That's where they went out from and they still have a house there in Chico. And so they come home every few years and then they travel around and you know, visit the churches that are supporting them, the people. And their kids were going to, ch- going to school up in Spokane. And so a lot of times they'd have to travel in between. And we became the natural motel. So if they were coming through, they could say, can we come and stay? And of course you can come and stay. And in fact, sometimes they would come through and we weren't there, but they could still come and stay and live in our house. And then their son is having to travel through and can he come and stay? Of course he can come and stay. And we're the benefactors of that kind of a relationship but it serves in the kingdom of God a very good purpose, and we should be useful to that. He says here in the sixth verse, you bring forth their journey after a godly sort, that this is a a godly thing that's being done. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12 says, That you would walk worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom in glory. There's a way that we should walk worthy of God. Or Colossians 1.10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That we should be worthy. This is a godly thing that, that Gaius is doing in his faithful service to these strangers, these itinerant uh, preachers. And he says, uh, born, uh, these strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a go- godly sword, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake, they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. And I I want to kind of emphasize this because there are a lot of ministries out there that don't seem to be uh, uh, attuned to taking nothing. Paul, when he went out, he took nothing. He supported himself. He was a tent maker. He worked. And then he would encourage the church to support these people people. It is proper for a church, for a congregation to pay a pastor. That is perfectly legitimate, and that's good. But in taking the gospel out to people, it is without any profit motive whatsoever. That the gospel is free of charge. It doesn't involve the collection of money. Now, we have kind of downplayed the collection of money. I, I, uh, I don't object to passing a plate. Uh, that's, that can be a good way and an efficient way of doing it. And it should be noted that when we take an offering, that that offering is actually an act of worship. We want to keep that in mind. And we have chosen to make it a very passive. This is a very personal act of worship on your part. You know, the box is in the back, and we don't don't ever make a push for money. We don't. This drove them crazy at the Free Methodist Church because they want us to buy this building. What are you doing to solve the problems? We don't know. We're going to see what the Lord brings our way. We we just don't know what's going to happen. You guys may end up getting this building back. It's, don't you care? Well, actually, no, we don't. Because we would rather see the Lord provide that means and to do it by whatever means he might happen. As it turns out, at the last minute, the means came to us, and we're, I don't know what the status is of the, of the process. I, th- I think it's pretty well culminated. I don't see Rick here, so I can't ask him. But... Uh, that, that is a pressure to some people. And they, they said, well, why don't you have a push in the congregation and tell them you need to raise this money? He said, no, that's not how we do things here. If God wants us to do something, he's going to supply the means. He's going to do it. And I can tell you, quite graphically, and Ken and Vicki will attest to this, 
we experienced this firsthand. Because when we decided to buy a house, we made certain assumptions and, and all that, and we just relied upon the Lord, and he brought it through, and he, he gave us that house in no uncertain terms. And it frustrated some people, thinking that, no. But God says, yes. But the gospel is free of charge, and it should go out that way. That word that is used there in, in in taking nothing of the Gentiles. The word is maiden, maiden, and it means nothing by choice. It's not because they desired to get it and they didn't get it. It's because by choice, they didn't want it. They're taking nothing from it because the important thing is that people freely get the gospel. That's the important part of it. Verse 7, because for his namesake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers in the gospel. You know that in verse 7, that taking nothing is contrasted in, uh, and reinforced by Jesus in Mark 6. Mark, the sixth chapter, verses 11 or 7 through 11, and I want to read that. And he called the 12 to himself, and he began to send them out two by two, and he gave them power over unclean spirits, and he commanded them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bag, no bread, no copper in their money belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He also said to them, in whatsoever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you that it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day of judgment than for that city. So Jesus himself took the disciples, sent them out two by two, and he says, you don't take anything. You make no provision for tomorrow. Because what did he say? Tomorrow's got plenty of worries for itself. Just be concerned right now. Don't worry about tomorrow. And he demonstrated to them because each one of them went out there and experienced the success that only God gives to that kind of a ministry. And when they came back, none of them went without a meal. None of them was slept in a cold place, they were all taken care of. They found a way. Because there was hospitality out there provided for them. And so it is that these itinerant preachers are doing the same thing. They're going out there, they're taking nothing, they're just dependent upon the people who are like Gaius, and hopefully like you and I, who will pro pro provide that means through the Lord Jesus Christ. We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers of the truth. And I'm going to tell you that most of us will take that kind of a part in God's work, even today. We aren't all called to be grand evangelists. We can't all be grand teachers. We can't command big works out there. But we are all fellow helpers. We are the ones who support we're the ones who do. We are the ones who pray. We are the ones who are there for these people who are out there. Sometimes they have needs that only we can take care of over here. And if God provides us the means to do so, we do it. We are then, by extension, the fellow helpers. We go into the second half of the, the letter, to the next couple of verses. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, he that doeth evil hath not seen God. 
I titled this message, To Be or Not To Be, Gaius or Diotrephes. Kind of has a poetic ring to it, don't you think? And so in the first part, we've covered the life of Gaius, this contact with Gaius, a faithful minister of Christ, somebody who is out there actually doing something in the field and is showing this kindness to those who are itinerant. He is the person that refreshes the heart of the Apostle John. And now we come to Diotrephes. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have preeminence among among them, receiveth us not. There always is within the greater body of Christ those who want to elevate themselves for the purpose of self-gratification. That there is always a feeling of power in being able to tell people what to do and when to do it. I hope that nobody in this room ever rises to that point. It's just not our place to do that. We just should not do that. This Diotrephes who loves to have the preeminence, he wants to be the top dog. He's the one, he's probably the richest one in the room and he gives the most. And I can remember uh, very graphically uh, some of the things that took place in at least one church that I belong to and where the one person who was the richest in the room and he gave the most to the church and therefore his attitude was, is that, hey, I give the most, so what I say carries a lot more value than anybody else in this room. And I have to tell you that that was the most dysfunctional board I've ever, I, I managed to avoid, after being on that board, I managed to avoid being on a board for about 25 or 30 years. Didn't want to do it. And the only way I got Rooker dude into it the 30 years later was that without my knowledge, they put my name on the, on the voting list. And for one thing, I don't think we should be voting on who's going to be leaders in the church. And the only reason that I've got any leadership in this church at all is because one Sunday morning I stood up and Anthony said, oh, and by the way, our leadership is going to be, and I was one of those people. Uh, It was without any consultation on my part. Because I'll tell you, I do not want to have any power over anyone, anywhere, at any time. It's just not the way I want to see it done. And it can be so dysfunctional when it happens. So in 1 Timothy 5.13, when we uh, talk about this pratting, uh, pratting, that means malicious gossip, gossip, disparaging. That's what the word means, to disparage. And so in in 1 Timothy 5.13, he talks about young widows. And he's giving Timothy instruction on what widows to take care of and which ones not to. And the young widows who have fallen away from Christ, you don't just keep providing for them. He says, and besides, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but also gossips and busybodies. And the the King James uh, renders that word uh, tattler, which means the same thing as this pratting. The person who is a malicious gossip and busybody saying things which they ought not. The tales that we carry should not be the bad tales that we take from one another. Let us carry all the good tales that we want. You can proclaim that as much as you want to one another any time you want. But that which is disparaging, keep it to yourself. Keep it between, if you have a, 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 a fault with somebody, Take it to them and make it right, you know. Bring some healing to it, but don't talk it all around. There's no reason to do that. So he says, um, let's see, where was I? In the uh, ninth verse, the tenth verse, wherefore if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, but forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. 
What a tremendous contrast this is to uh, Jesus' words. Go to Mark, the 10th chapter, uh, 42nd to 45th verses. And he says this, but Jesus called them to himself and he said to them, you know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. Ah, yet it shall not be so among you. So this means this is the word to you and I. It will not be that way among you, but whoever desires to become great, and I love that song that we used to sing years ago, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. See, so he says, if you want to be great among you, shall become your servant. And whosoever, you desire, uh, whosoever of you desires to be first shall be the slave of all. So if you want to be great here in Redmond, Oregon, there's the example that's set right there. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Probably not likely that any of us would be called to that extent. But see the contrast? And Diotrephes did not get it. And then he talks of the postman. From now on, we can call Jeremy Demetrius. <laughs> Demetrius hath good report of all men and of the truth itself, yea, and we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. The Apostle John lived a life in such a way that everybody knew exactly where he was. He says, I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee and shall speak face to face. I like that. An old man at 93, 94 years old, he's close to the very end of his life, and he's saying, I plan to see you face to face. Peace be to thee. Our friends salute thee. Greet the friends by name. He says, I had many things to write, and I see that he probably did. Because you read in John, the 21st chapter, the 25th verse, at the very end of the Gospel of John, he says this about Jesus. He says, and there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Amen. John was a man who had a lot to say, and certainly not enough time to say it. I know the feeling. Go and be Gaius. Go and be Gaius. Go out of here, greet your friends. Somebody comes to your mind, give them a call. Write them a letter. Encourage them. Somebody has given you encouragement in the past, look them up. Look them up. Build them up. I think one of the funnest things that I did just a few years ago was I looked up the pastor who baptized me when I was 11 years old. He was back in uh, Indiana, and he had a little presence on Facebook, and for about a year and a half until he died, he and I had a lot of good correspondence. It was a good thing. And I trust that he was encouraged to know that after a whole lifetime of faithful service to the Lord Jesus Christ, that at least one came back and said, I appreciate what you did in my life. It was a good thing. Go out there and do that. Lord, I pray that you would indeed accompany us as we go out into this world around us. I pray, Lord, that we would be aware of those opportunities of good service that you have created beforehand and that we would be faithful to walk in them. Build us up, Lord, that we might be more and more like you. Make us to be servants such as Gaius here, who after all these years sets for us a grand example of how we should conduct ourselves here in Redmond, Oregon. We praise you, Lord Jesus. And we pray to you, God, the Father, through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.